Well, hey, Rock family, good to be with you guys this wonderful Saturday morning. Everybody excited today? My goodness, what a great day. God has some great things in store for us. I couldn't be more excited for Easter, uh, you know, launching out next week. We start Passion Week. That's uh, what many people call it because it was Christ's passion to come and to suffer and to die for all of us. And so it's a holy week. This is a time where, um, my goodness, we are just so blessed to be able to be a part of what God is doing on the planet. And this is a wide open opportunity. I want to encourage you to invite as many people as you can. Because in this season, people are thinking about Christ. They're thinking about the death, burial, and resurrection of our Lord. They're thinking about church. And uh, many people said that if they were just invited, that they would come, okay? So you've got a wide open opportunity. Make sure on your way out to grab some flyers, some invite cards, and that sort of a thing. Door hangers, if you want to go door to door in your neighborhood, that's a great way. Just knock on a door. If someone opens the door, you hand it to them and invite them. If they don't open the door, just hang it on their door and then uh, pray for them as you head out. And that's a great way to invite people to church as well. And like I said, it's a wide open opportunity. We estimate we're going to be hosting over 15,000 people here live that weekend as well, that we're going to have many more online. And I'm believing God for well over 500. In, in fact, in my prayer time, I was praying over 500. And God said, stop that. It's 1,000. So I was like, all right, it's 1,000. All right, Lord, we're believing God for 1,000 people getting saved here live at the Rock Church and World Outreach Center that weekend. All right? So pray with us, believe with us, but you got to get out there and do the work and invite someone to church. And as well, I want to encourage you guys, if you can serve, man, come on Saturday, enjoy, but then come Sunday and serve and help us out hosting the thousands that God is going to bring here at The Rock. God is so good. I'm going to get into the word of the Lord today. Anybody excited about the word? All right, get your Bible in hand. Come on. You didn't come to hear an internet suggestion. You didn't come to hear from O Magazine or Dr. Phil or anything like that. You came to hear from God. So let's prepare our hearts. Tune out distractions. Put your cell phones on silent mode. I want to encourage you not to get up and walk around during the message, and especially during the altar call. And if you got your kids with you under grade six, all right, make sure to get them over to the greatest children's ministry on the planet. We've got ages zero through six, and that's a great way to get them involved in the church in their level because we don't have child care. We have children's church, and there is a difference. They're the greatest children's ministry on the planet over there, loving your kids, encouraging them, and supplementing what you're doing at home, right? Come on, parents, what you're doing at home, raising them up in the will and the way of the Lord. And so that's a great encouragement for you to get in and get the Word of God at your level. You're welcome to stand at this time if you have the ability to stand. If you don't, just put your heart in a posture and position where you're ready to receive. Come on, even online, join us in prayer right now. Let's believe God for you to receive the Word wherever you're at. Father, we come to you today in the mighty name of Jesus. Lord, we're so grateful as we come into your house that we have the ability to hear your voice and to follow you. God, it's not by the power of a man or a woman, young or old, black, white, brown, tall, short, thin, wide, educated, uneducated, rich or poor. No, God, it's only by the power of your Holy Spirit that we have the ability to hear you. So God, today, may deep call into deep, God. Open our eyes to see, our ears to hear, and our hearts have a good understanding. May we be good ground where the word is sown and may it produce fruit in each and every one of our individual lives as we silence our souls to hear what the Spirit is speaking to the church. We welcome you, Holy Spirit. You are the teacher of the church. Be our teacher. Be our guide. Give us your vision, your wisdom, your instruction, your direction, even the correction where we've gotten off track. Lord, please get us back on track with you. Father, we'll give you the praise, the glory, and the honor for it. Today, Lord, don't just bless us. No, God, we ask that you bless all of our brothers and sisters here in the Inland Empire, as well as around the planet that are both preaching and hearing the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. God, if they're lifting up your name, preaching your gospel truth, God, I bless them. We pray, Lord, that you bless all the churches, God, worldwide, many parts of the planet. It's already Sunday, so bless the Baptists, Lutherans, Methodists, Episcopalians, Charismatics, Pentecostals, Calvary Chapels, Assemblies of God, Foursquare, Evangelical Free, Victory Outreach, Set Free Churches, God. We bless uh, uh, those that are gathered today, Lord, keeping the Sabbath day holy, but lifting up the name of Jesus, God, we bless our Adventist brothers and sisters and Messianic Jewish congregations, God, the Catholic Church, God, that's believing in your name, lifting up your truth, God. We thank you, Father God. Many churches, much diversity in the body of Christ, but Lord, there's a church out there for everyone. So we bless your church. Bless the churches that are gathered tonight, having a Saturday night service, God. There's too many to name by name, but you know them all by name. So, God, if they're preaching your gospel, we pray that you bless them. Lord, bless the persecuted church. We pray that you strengthen them, encourage them, deliver them. May they endure to the end to the glory of God. And, Father, we do continue to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. We bless Israel. It's in Jesus' mighty name. We're all in agreement. We say amen, amen. amen. Today, as you're having a seat, get your Bibles and go with me to Genesis chapter number one. We've been in a series called Creating Sacred Lives. This is part number six. Now, don't worry if you didn't get part number one through five. We will uh, review and get you up to speed where you need to be today, and today's message will stand on its own. 
But I just want to remind you, thinking about what we've been talking about, creating sacred lives. We found out that in this series that we have the ability to create a life that is sacred. What does that mean, sacred? You know, oftentimes we think about sacred as something, ooh, oh, wait a second, it's sacred. It, you know, we think of sacred places or sacred things, and we don't really understand what they are. There's something mystical about them. And yet, sacred simply means this. It means connected to God. That's why the church is a sacred place, is because it's a place where we can come and connect to God because it's God's house. The Bible is a sacred book. Why? Because it's God's word to us, and we can connect to God through the word of God. And all of us have to create a life on our own that is connected to God. Our lives should be connected to God. That was a great place to say amen, by the way, all right? And so how do we do that? Well, and you remember we talked about the Genesis story, how God created the heavens and the earth, and we've mirrored how we can create a sacred life through the creation account. We started by saying that when God said, let there be light, that if we put the sacred discipline of prayer into our life, that it can bring light to our darkness. As God speaks, it illuminates our hearts. Suddenly we see and we're able to understand what to do in life. Remember the next time we were together, we talked about how God created an atmosphere around the earth that he separated the waters beneath from the waters above, and how we talked about as we create that sacred discipline of worship in our life, bowing our will to the Father, that it creates an atmosphere for God to move in our lives. Then we talked about how God separated the waters from the land, and he planted seed in the earth, and we talked about our Bible study, how as we plant the seeds of God's word in our life, that they take root and they produce. Then we were talking about how God created the sun and the moon and the stars, And you remember we talked about solitude and how when we get alone with God, how when we get quiet and when we start to comprehend things and we allow God to just come and dwell with us and speak to us, that all of a sudden we can see the greatness of God. And then last time we were together, you remember Pastor Jessica brought us to an understanding about fasting. We talked about how God created the fish in the sea and the birds of the air. And how when we fast, it can take us to depths with God that we couldn't go on our own. And it can bring us up to new heights as God brings breakthrough and brings us through that time of fasting. Today, we're going to continue on in the creation story, day number six. We're in Genesis chapter number one. We're going to start in verse number 24 and read down through verse number 31. Okay, Genesis chapter one, verse number 24, it says this. Then God said, let the earth bring forth the living creature according to its kind cattle and creeping thing and beast on the earth, each according to its kind, and it was so. Verse 25, and God made the beast of the earth according to its kind, cattle according to its kind, and everything that creeps on the earth according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. Verse 26, then God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Now notice the plurality of what God is saying. Now God is one, right? And yet we find that there are three distinct persons of God, right? Not three gods, one God, but three expressions of the same God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Now, that can be hard to understand, and yet if you look at your own life, you can understand God a whole lot better. Why? Because there are three distinct expressions of your life. Did you know that? Many times we say, well, it's just me. I'm just one. Yeah, you are, but, but many times we look at the outside, the exterior, and we say, well, that's the person, but that's not really the person, right? Because Without your hand or without your foot, you can still exist. So that's not the whole of your person. You, you have a body, but, but, but you understand that there's something deeper going on. Your thought life, your mind. But even that is not the real you. That's your thoughts. That's your will. That's your emotions. But the real you is deep on the inside in your heart. There is a spirit man. That's the eternal part of you. That's the real you that if you die, if your body ceases to exist and you're separated from your body, that lives on into eternity. So you are a spirit that has a soul, a mind, a will, and emotions that lives in a body. That's your earth suit, or the Bible calls it a tent. It is a temporary dwelling because eventually when we die and we go to be with Jesus, we will get our eternal dwelling. A new body. Oh, my goodness. Praise the Lord. Mine's going to have abs. I'm excited about it. That's why God can say, let us make man in our image, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Just like your body, your soul, and your spirit, God is one but three expressed persons. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps over the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Can I just pause for a moment and digress about something for a second? Because there's been a whole lot of news. A whole lot of people are confused about what a man is and what a woman is and how God created them. 
But God is not confused about gender. God is not confused about sex. God, God created them in his own image, male and female. He created them. There are two genders. That's it. They're not fluid. You can't pop from one to the other without problems. And if you look at the research, the change can be devastating. I don't say this to harm anyone. I say this out of love, that, that if you're struggling in this area and the devil is lying to you or you're confused in that area, come talk to us and, and let us work with you because you were fearfully and wonderfully made. And God wasn't confused when he created you. He created you that specific way in love. And guess what else? In the image of God. And he says, I want you to have dominion. I want you to rule over things in life, not to be ruled by passions and lusts and carnal things. He created them, male and female, he created them. Verse 28, then God blessed them, and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it, have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. This was God's original intent for mankind right there. That's what God desired of us. Now, I'm going to drop down past uh, everything that he says that we can eat and just go to verse number 31. It says this, Then God saw everything that he had made, and indeed it was. I love this. Everything before was good, but when God finished creation, he said it was very good. So the evening and the morning were the sixth day. As I look at this part of the creation story, obviously there's truths that we can take out of it, but we're talking about creating sacred lives. And we've been talking about sacred disciplines, things that connect us with God. What do we see that God created the beast of the earth, the creeping things, as well as man on the planet? Here's what I see. I see the sacred discipline of service. It's one of those ones that maybe you wouldn't think of as a discipline. Maybe you wouldn't think that this would connect you with God. And yet, from the very beginning, we can see that we were created in the very image of God. And God is a worker. Think about it for a second. God created the heavens and the earth. When, when Jesus even was talking about how God rested on the Sabbath, he told the men and women that were talking to him at that time, don't you realize that my Father and I have been working from the very beginning? In the Proverbs, it talks about wisdom, and really it's a picture of Jesus at God's side rejoicing over the creation, how they worked together to create the heavens and the earth. He talks almost like construction terms. I was laying the foundations building the pillars that hold up the earth, those sorts of things, hanging the earth on nothing. These were all works that God did, and God continued to work. Jesus continues to hold everything together by the word of his power. He's been at work ever since the creation. God is a worker, and we are made in the image of God. You're there in Genesis 1. Look at Genesis 2 for a second. Genesis 2 kind of recaps some of the creation story, and it says this in Genesis chapter 2, verse number 8. It says, The Lord God planted a garden eastward, in Eden, and there he put the man whom he had formed. Now, who planted the garden? God did, right? Now, anybody ever planted a garden? Okay, a couple of you guys have. That's work, isn't it? To plant a garden isn't easy. I mean, especially for those of us, I, I don't think I have a green thumb. I think I have the black thumb of death that has the little skull and crossbones on it because everything I plant doesn't seem to work. It's almost like I got the poison touch, not the Midas touch. I wish I could grow fruits and veggies and all that kind of stuff. My wife just got into this thing, and she's starting to learn this. She started growing wheatgrass so that we could have that in the morning. It's supposed to be healthy for you. And my son's like, man, that just tastes like grass, like fresh-cut mowed grass. Why am I drinking this, Mom? I don't understand it. But she started growing it, and sure enough, here come the birds, right? They want to have some of the—they're pecking around on it, so she had to move from outside to inside. And so now we got grass on the inside. Now our dogs are going over there eating it. And I'm like, what, what are we doing? I'm not eating that grass if the dog's eating it. But it's work. You got to till the ground. You got to create rows. You got to plant the seeds. You got to water it. You got to make sure it's getting enough sun. You got to make sure that the soil has the right moisture and the right temperature and, and all the right combination of 11 herbs and spices that make it grow properly, right? And so here God planted a garden. God is a worker. But look at verse number 15. It says, Then the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to tend and keep it. Right off the bat, God gives man a job. In fact, here's a principle for you, ladies and gentlemen, especially you single people in here. God gave man a job before God gave man a wife. Ladies, if he don't have a job, it's not time to get married. Because if you have a job 
and he doesn't have a job, guess who's the breadwinner? And the Bible says that the man is supposed to be providing for his wife and his children. It doesn't mean you can't make more money. I understand two-income homes. It's hard to live in California. We get that the day and age that we live in. Inflation. And ladies, if you've got a better job that makes more money, hey, that's okay. As long as the man's got a job, he's working. He's the head of the house. Hey, praise the Lord. We are not insecure. Go ahead and make that money, girl. Sugar mama. All right, it's okay. In those terms, as long as he's working, we're good, right? As long as he's leading, we're good. But if you're the only one working and he's sitting there playing video games... He might as well move back into his mama's basement, right? We don't want to marry a big kid and then take care of him. He doesn't need a mama. He needs a wife. Okay, I'll stop right there. I'll just, I'll just get off that, that platform for a second. Drop down to verse number 18, lest we forget. And the Lord God said, it's not good that man should be alone. I will make him a what? Uh Uh-oh, a what? Helper, ladies, just in case you didn't know, (laughs) you got a job too right? You're supposed to help. The man was there to tend the garden. The woman was there to help the man tend the garden. Gentlemen, we need some help. Hello. That's why the Bible says he who finds a wife finds a good thing, finds favor with the Lord. Why? Because she's there to help. She's not there to hurt. She's not there to nag. She's not there to break you down, bust you up, rule over you. No, she's there to come alongside as an heir of life. That's the way God intended. Remember, God created them in his own image, male and female. He created them. So men and women, we are workers like God is a worker. That's why we see service in the midst of the creation story. The beasts of the earth tell us this too, don't they? Oftentimes you'll find the ox and the donkey as images of workers. Even Jesus himself, the suffering servant, right, was likened to the ox that we see all throughout the Bible. He bore a burden. He says, come to me, you who are heavy laden and burdened, weighed down with many cares, and I will give you rest. Why? Because he's the stronger servant. When you get yoked up with Jesus, Jesus will carry the burden for you. His yoke is easy and his burden is light. But he's still serving and he's still moving forward and able to shoulder those heavy burdens. See, man was built to serve from the very beginning. Serving connects us to God because Jesus came as the servant. And when we serve, we're following his example and ultimately we serve Christ himself. See, service sets us apart unto God. When you serve, it literally sets you apart from the rest. There are people who don't want to serve. They want to be the big shot. They want to rule. They want to delegate. They want to lead. They want to do all those things, but they don't want to humble themselves and serve. And yet Jesus came among us as one who serves. And when we serve, it's sacred. Why? Because it sets us apart unto God. It's a holy thing when we serve. J.G. Holland said, a noble deed is a step towards God, and when we serve others, we serve the Lord. Turn with me to Matthew chapter number 25. Matthew chapter number 25, probably the most potent scriptures when we take a look at what we do here on the earth and how it impacts eternity. Matthew chapter number 25, Jesus is speaking about the end. He's taking his disciples down a train of thought, but he talks about the end times, what's going to happen when he comes in his glory and the holy angels come with him verse number 34 take a look at it with me it says this then the king will say to those on his right hand come you blessed of my father and inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world for i was hungry and you gave me food i was thirsty and you gave me drink i was a stranger and you took me in i was naked and you clothed me i was sick and you visited me i was in prison And you came to me. Notice all the things that they did for the Lord. They served him. They gave him food. They gave him drink. They gave him clothing. They visited him. They came to him in prison. They were serving the Lord. I love the attitude of the saints, though. Look at this. Verse number 37. Then the righteous will answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you drink? When did we see you a stranger and take you in, or naked and clothe you? Jesus, I would have remembered you being naked. I think I would remember that. But I don't remember that. When did we see that? Verse 39, or when did we see you sick or in prison and come to you? Verse 40, and the king will answer and say to them, Assuredly, I say to you, inasmuch as you did it to one of the least of these, my brethren, you did it to me. 
Notice he says that when you serve others, that you are serving the Lord Jesus himself. My goodness, that puts a new light on how we serve, doesn't it? No longer is it a grind, but now it's a glory. Why? Because all of a sudden we realize that I'm not serving somebody that doesn't deserve it. I'm not serving somebody that's foolish. I'm not serving somebody that's down on their luck or impoverished. I'm not serving somebody that's disgusting or deterring. No, I'm serving the Lord himself and serving my brother and my sister. Interesting, interestingly enough, he goes on in the next verses. We won't read them for time's sake, but he starts to talk about those that did not come to him, those that did not feed him, those that did not clothe him. And, and they start to say, well, wait a second, Lord, when, when did we see this? Well, when did we see you? And he says, if you didn't do it to the one of the least of these, my brother, you didn't do it to me. See, there's no God connection when we're disconnected from service. Just as there were clean and unclean animals, there are things that we do to connect us with God in service and things that we can do to disconnect us from God in selfishness. When we're selfish, it disconnects us from God. But when we serve, we are connected with God. It creates a sacred life. You know, when we were building this building, Pastor Jim tells the story that he was always coming over and checking on the progress, checking on the work. But he wanted to come and he just wanted to pray. He wanted to be alone and he wanted to pray. But every time he would come, there would be people here working or serving or church members. And he would always have to go and give a tour or he'd always have to go and, you know, have a meeting or spend more money or, you know, different things were going on. And so he was just frustrated. And he talks about how he finally cried out to God one time. He said, God, I just want to go to the church and I just want to be alone. I don't want anyone there. I just want to be with you. Me, you and the empty building, I want to pray. I want to spend time with you there, God, because we're going to move in, and it's going to be crazy, and I just need some time alone with you. And so he comes down to the church late at night. It's, the sun's getting ready to set, and he's here. And, and he comes in, and he walks around the building, and all of a sudden, he's here in the sanctuary. And all of a sudden, off to the side, he sees three figures show up at the door. And he looks over, and he recognizes them. They're some of our church members. They'd come by bus. They weren't people that had a lot of money. They didn't have cars or anything like that. In fact, they had some special needs. And so they came in and they, pastor, pastor. And he thought, oh God, I just wanted to be with you alone. But he wasn't going to be cruel to them. He loved them and he was going to be very kind to them. And, oh, hey, hey, it's so good to see you. And they said, pastor, can, can you show us what's going on? Because we don't understand. Is that the front or is this the front? And so he brought him in. He said, no, 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 no. This is going to be the, the stage. This will be the platform. There will be chairs that go all the way up here, all the way up to the back. They're going, wow. He says, there will be family rooms on both sides with glass enclosures so that the parents, if they, if they have their kids and they're new, they can come and get them, uh, you know, just acclimated to the church. There will be nursing mother's rooms for ladies that just had babies on the side, and they can nurse their babies and keep them with them, and that way they don't have to be a disturbance to anybody. There will be a big foyer out in the back there. That, that way people can come in, and they can see what's going on in the church, and there will be a, a great for and he took him outside. Here's, here's the courtyard. There's going to be a fountain right there in the middle. We'll do baptisms. This whole side, this whole wing is all going to be children's ministry. Wow. This side will be our Bible college and our youth ministry. There's going to be a food distribution center down at the end with truckloading docks. It's just going to be amazing. And they said, wow, that's amazing, Pastor. And at the end of it, they said, Pastor, we've, we've got to go. We've got to catch our bus home. But thank you so much for showing us around. We so appreciate you and we love you, Pastor. And he said, I love you too. Thank you so much. And he watched them as they walked down this trail that was to be our main entrance. As they walked, remember they had special needs. He, he talks about how they were stumbling and how he could see the dust coming off their feet, dirt going everywhere, and he just thought, God, I just wanted to be alone with you. And God whispered to his heart in that moment and said, you just were. When you've done it to the least of these, my brethren, you've done it to me. When we serve others, it sets us apart to be with God. But second thing is this, is that service submits our hearts to God's commands. Service submits our hearts to God's commands. Can anybody tell me what the greatest command is in the Bible? Anybody know that answer? To, to what? To what? To, to love who? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, right? Anybody know what the second command is? Because Jesus said the second command is like it. It's to to love your neighbor as yourself, right? So we understand that the greatest commandment is to love God, and the second greatest commandment is to love others. See, when you serve 
others in love, it submits your heart to God's command. Uh, are you listening? That's a practical way because we think of love as an emotion. We think of love as a feeling. Oh, I've got the butterflies. I, I, I love them. Oh, I love that girl. I love that boy. Oh, my goodness. And, and so we think of loving our neighbor as, oh, I love them. Oh, I've got butterflies for my neighbor. That's a little weird, isn't it? I don't have butterflies for my neighbor. In fact, I, I've got sometimes bad words for my neighbor. I don't like them sometimes. Sometimes I've got a frown. Sometimes I've got a frustration. Sometimes I've got a, I want to avoid my neighbor. But God tells me to love my neighbor. See, love is not a feeling. Love is a choice. L love is not a noun. Love is a verb. But love is an action. And so God says to love your neighbor as yourself. What does that look like? It looks like serving your neighbor because when you serve, now you are committed and submitted to God's commands. Loving our neighbors as ourselves. It's a direct submission of our hearts to the command to love God and to love others. Let me show this to you in the book of Galatians. You're there in Matthew. Turn back to the book of Galatians, okay? Right after the Gospels, find Acts, Romans, 1st and 2nd Corinthians, and then Galatians chapter number 5. Galatians chapter number 5. And this shows us the heart and the spirit that we're to serve in. Galatians chapter number 5. And take a look with me at verse number 13. It says this, Galatians chapter 5, verse number 13. For you, brethren, have been called to liberty. Only do not use liberty as an opportunity for the flesh. Now here's one I want to get to. Look at this. But through love serve one another. Do you notice the command of God? See, these are not the suggestions of God. These are not the, you know, maybe you should or maybe you shouldn't. It's okay. Either. No. When we read something like this in the Word of God, it is a command to our hearts. Something that God desires for our life. He says, I want you through love to serve one another. Why? Because we're going to fulfill our command to love God. And as we love God, we're going to love what God loves. God loves people. And therefore, when we love others, we're fulfilling the command of God. So he says, here's your motivation behind it. It's not because you feel like it. It's not because you have the means to do it. It's not because that's your bread and butter. No, it's because God has given you his love. He's shed his love abroad in your heart. And now that you're full of the love of God, you can't help but express that love to what God loves. Therefore, I'm going to love my neighbor as myself. Through love, serve one another. That's how you can love the unlovable. That's how you can serve people that are hard to be around. That's how you can be with your extended family that doesn't like you, and frankly, you don't like them. That's how you can love your neighbor when they've been keeping you up through the night with their loud music, or they let their dog poop on your lawn again, and it's frustrating to you. That's how you can love people that don't vote the way you vote. And they don't look the way that you look. See, if we would, as the church, get a hold of this love and start to serve one another, there would be a revolution in our land. And God would move in powerful and mighty ways. One of my friends that has gone on to be with the Lord, his name is Martin. Martin is a mighty man of God here at the church. Some of you guys know Martin been around for a long time, long enough to remember him. Martin was a, a, a small man. He wasn't very tall. He's probably about this big. Had cornrows, big gold tooth in the front. I absolutely love Martin. Martin was my friend. Martin was always here. Didn't matter what was going on, he was here. My goodness. Even as his health was ailing, he was on the front rows. Remember one day I came walking in from the back. I had just finished greeting at the back door. He was sitting in one of these seats up here, arms open wide. Let me get my hands on you. Just wanted to give me a hug. Love Martin. Love Martin. Martin was great. Martin was one of our ushers. Martin, uh, he had a testimony. I remember he, he filmed a video that we showed at his funeral. I had the privilege of doing his funeral when he went on to be with the Lord. And uh, he, in this video, was testifying about what God did in his life. And he said he was on drugs. He was just not a good man. And uh, he had some health challenges that he actually went to the hospital, and he died on the operating table. And he said, I died and I had an encounter with Jesus. And Jesus spoke to me about my life and it revolutionized and changed my life. He says, I left this earth a fool and I came back a preacher. Martin just loved Jesus. Because Martin loved Jesus, he loved people. And I remember every time we'd give an altar call, Martin would be looking at the hands. And he'd sit there and he had this straight face on. He'd be in the back. He'd be watching who raised their hand. 
Because if they raised their hand and they didn't come forward, Martin was going to march across this sanctuary. You'd see him. Big old suit. I mean, it looked like a big brother suit. You know what I'm saying? It was too big for Martin. But he was marching in that suit, walking across. He was going to go get them. And he would grab them, and he would bring them to the altar. I remember one time Martin walking down this aisle right here. He had a kid, one on each arm, right? Well, under both arms, they were about as big as he was. But he was just laughing. <laughs> oh, oh, oh. <laughs> laughing all the way down because he just loved people so much that when he got to serve them, it just filled him up with joy because he was fulfilling the commands of God and he felt the pleasure of God bringing people to the altar to give their lives to Jesus. It deeply impacted my life. I always remember that and I always think about that. And I love when I see our new ushers. My goodness, I've got some friends that I see them. They go after them. Some of you guys go after them. You bring people to these altars just like Martin. Why? Because service submits our hearts to God's commands. Last one for us today is this, is that service is greatness. A lot of people that want to be great, a lot of people that want to win, a lot of people that want to rule and reign, and yet Jesus told us the way up is down, and the way down is up. If you elevate yourself, you're going to be brought low, but if you Lower yourself, God will bring you high because service is greatness. Remember, God created all things, and the crown of his creation was man and woman, made in his image, workers. And he said, This is very good. Service is greatness. Turn back to the Gospels to Mark, Mark chapter number 10. Mark chapter number 10. The disciples have been having an argument. They've been arguing over which one of them is the greatest disciple. They conceded, hey, Jesus is better than all of us, but I'm better than you. Probably Peter, James, and John, they had an edge. Well, he took us along, and he never took y'all along. We're better than you. Probably some of the other ones said, well, wait a second, hold on. We were the one that got the fish and the loaves. You didn't get the fish and the loaves. We're more resourceful. Therefore, we're greater than you. Some of them might have said, like, Nathaniel, hey, he didn't see any of you. He saw me under the tree. You, you got brought to Jesus. I, I, I had a personal call from Jesus. I'm greater than you. But look at what it says in Mark chapter number 10. We're going to start in verse number 42 and read down through verse number 45. It says this, but Jesus called them to himself and said to them, you know that those who are considered rulers over the Gentiles lord it over them. And their great ones exercise authority over them. Verse 23. Yet it shall not be so among you. But whoever desires to become great among you shall be your what? Servant. Verse 44. And whoever you desires to be first shall be slave of all. Now listen. In the United States of America, we don't like that word slavery. But guess what? In their time, they didn't like the word either, especially Israelites, because they knew that their ancestors were enslaved in Egypt. It wasn't servitude where they sold themselves to go and serve and pay off a debt. No, this was slavery where they were forced into labor. And they were so proud about it that they said, we'll, we, we, we'll never be slaves again. God brought us out of slavery. We're enslaved by no man. They were proud and arrogant about it. And here Jesus throws it in their face, says, you want to be first? You better be slave. <laughs> Verse 45, for even the Son of Man, Jesus himself, did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Jesus himself came as a slave, not just a slave, the lowest level slave. He came as a bond servant to all of us. T.W. Manson said, in the kingdom of God, service is not a stepping stone to nobility. It is nobility. The only kind of nobility that is recognized. Martin Luther King Jr. said, everybody can be great because anybody can serve. One of our heroes present day, not just mine, but a lot of people, one of our heroes presently is Mother Teresa. You guys know her. You've heard her name, probably heard things quoted that she said. She's literally impacted the world. Mother Teresa was known because she was a Catholic nun in Calcutta, India. 
And she was just doing her duties, and one day she knew that her duties was to go and to visit the poor. And within that visit, she had what she called a call within a call. And she was to serve the poorest of the poor. And her specific ministry was that she would give dignity to those that were dying. She made this statement. It blows my mind. She said this. She said that she would give people a beautiful death, which is for people who live like animals to die like angels, loved and wanted. Who wants that ministry? Who wants to take care of people that are dying? People that are literally on their last breaths? Hospice care? No one likes that. And she wasn't getting paid for it. She was called to it. In addition to opening a house for people that were dying, she opened houses for people with leprosy, for orphans and homeless youth. By 2007, her organization, the Missionaries of Charity, numbered 450 brothers, 5,000 sisters worldwide, operating 600 mission schools and shelters in 120 countries with over a million volunteers helping. In 1979, she was recognized for her service with the Nobel Peace Prize, as well as the next year, the highest civilian award the Indian government could give. Today, we quote her, we honor her memory, we try and serve what she served. She said these words, spread love everywhere you go. First of all, give love to your children, to your wife or husband, to a next door neighbor. Let no one ever come to you without leaving better and happier. She also said, don't look for big things, just do small things with great love. If you want to be great in the kingdom of God, become a servant. What ways can we serve? Practically, what can we do? Well, look for what God has put in your hand. Just like Moses had a staff in his hand. He was a shepherd. He knew the wilderness. God said, with this staff, I'm going to deliver the children of Israel. God knew that he needed a shepherd. He needed somebody who knew the wilderness because they were going to be traveling through that same wilderness to get to the promised land. You may be good at something that you can use to serve others. How about this? Be a listening ear. Be hospitable. Pray for others. Uh, my dad, he was good at computers, and so he started just writing computer programs for the church. Eventually, he served in our, uh, in our Christian school for the kids. He was teaching their, their computer classes twice a week. Why? Because God had put that in his hand, and therefore, he used it to serve others. Put your hand to what it finds to do. You may not be great at it, but there might be a need, and you say, well, hey, I'll, I'll go help with the kids. Hey, I'll, I'll go help with the outreach. I, I can usher. I can greet. I, I can clean. I can do something. Whatever your hand finds for you to do, just start doing it, and God will open that up to a greater ministry. Be creative. The Holy Spirit will lead you. Ask God every day, God, how can I serve? How can I love others? How can I fulfill your commands? And God, how can I be great in your kingdom as I serve the people around me? Even your job can be used in service to others. Work for those in authority as you work and serve the Lord himself and watch as God creates that into a holy, sacred space. Husbands can serve their wives by helping around the house. Wives can serve their husbands by creating an environment that brings peace and comfort. Children can serve their parents by doing more than is expected and without being asked. And parents can serve their children by spending time with them and playing with them. You can serve in the church, serve in a charity, serve in the community, pick up trash, mow a neighbor's lawn, help the elderly with things they have a hard time doing. The opportunities are endless. Just look for something to do. Pick up a towel like Jesus did and go and wash your brother's feet. What does that mean? Serve somebody. I want to close today with Colossians chapter 3, verse number 23 and verse number 24. It says this, and whatever you do, everybody say whatever. Come on, say it with some San Bernardino attitude. Say whatever. And whatever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not to men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the reward of the inheritance, for you serve the Lord Christ. Remember, we started this by saying that service connects us with God. When we serve others, we now are serving the Lord Christ. Your service is sacred, and it will create a sacred life as you go out and do that which God has called you to do, that God has created you to do. You are a worker. God has built them male and female. doesn't matter which one you are. You were built to work. You are strong. You are tough enough. And you can get out there and do something for somebody. And as you do, you're not just serving man. You're serving the Lord Christ. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes with me for a moment? And let's just take some time and ask the Holy Spirit. Say, God, what are you speaking to me? And then listen for his voice.
today, what is God speaking to you? Maybe today God is talking to you about serving. There might be an opportunity that he's placed in front of you. Maybe he's identifying an area of pride that's stopped you from serving. Serving is humbling. In our pride, we say, I don't want to serve. I don't want to be a slave. Our pride would shout, I won't be a slave. And yet Jesus came as a servant, as a slave. Apostle Paul said we're slaves to righteousness. We have to do the bidding of our master. God says, will you go and love others? If you've identified an area of pride in your life, just repent of it. Give it to the Lord. Maybe today God is identifying an area that you can serve. Like we said, it might be in the community. Or it might be here in the church. Plenty of opportunities, plenty of needs. In both. It could be today God is calling you to serve in your home. That's the first area that we serve. If you've been having trouble in your marriage, could it be that you have been too prideful to serve your spouse? Might be a strained relationship in your family or on the job. God's saying, if you'll serve them and love them, I'll work that out. What's God speaking to you today? If God's been speaking to you, make sure to write it down. And if I don't write stuff down, I forget it. I don't want you to forget what God's been speaking to you. Just take a moment, commit it to a note. If you'd like to share with a faith-filled friend, your spouse, someone that you trust, you're welcome to. Even online, if you want to post in the comment section. It's always encouraging if it's appropriate to post that right there in the comments and say what God's been speaking to you, scriptures or words or different things. Once again, let's pray. Father, those things that we've committed today, we commit back to your heart, God. We pray, Lord, that you would give us the grace, your strength on our behalf when we can't do it to serve, God, like you would have us to. To love the unlovable, to reach out, to be the arms and the hands and the feet of Jesus. And God, ultimately, we know that even in your own strength, God, that we are serving you. And if we've done it to the least of these, we've done it unto you, and there's great reward. There is an inheritance that awaits us. So, Father, we thank you in advance. Thank you, Lord, that as those opportunities present themselves to us, that we will take them, God. We'll grab a towel like Jesus did and wash the feet of the saints even those that are undeserving. We love you, God. It's in Jesus' name we pray these things. Everybody in agreement said, amen, amen, amen. Today, before we head out, I want to just make sure that your heart and life is right with Jesus Christ. It'd be a tragedy if we stop right there, we let you go, and you died and ended up in hell. I don't want that for you. You don't want that for you, but more than both of us, guess what? God doesn't want that for you. That's why he sent Jesus, beaten, bloody, and hung on the cross, was that you didn't have to die and go to hell, but that you could be connected with him for eternity in heaven. Now, that doesn't happen just because you showed up to a church service. Sometimes people think, I, I came to church. Does that mean I'm right with God? No. Because you can't just show up a place, call yourself a thing, and it makes you a thing. You know, our society, you can be anything you want if you just call yourself that thing, but that doesn't work with God. Think about it practically. What if I told you I want to be a car, and so I go to my garage, sit in my garage, say, I'm a car. Beep, beep, broom, broom, I'm a car. There'd be a lot of people out there in the world that would agree with me, but could I ever house people in my body and take them 65 miles per hour down the freeway? No. Come on, let's not play games. 
I will never become a car. I could, I could get onto an auto website, watch a live stream about cars, and call myself a car, say, beep, beep, vroom, vroom, I'm a car. And I'll never become a car. I can't just sit in church, watch a church service online, on live stream. Call yourself a Christian. Say, amen, hallelujah, I'm a Christian. And that makes you a Christian. It doesn't. Something deeper has to take place. And yet there's a lot of people that think because they show up to a church, call themselves a Christian, that makes them a Christian. Come on, today I'm not playing games. We're talking about your eternal life. Let me love you enough, respect you enough, and honor you enough to tell you the truth. You won't make it that way. Sometimes people say, but pastor, I've been a good person. Done a lot of good deeds. Doesn't that mean that I'm going to get to go to heaven? I, I know that God sees that and he appreciates that. My good deeds outweigh my bad. Yeah, I used to be bad, but I cleaned up my act and now I've been really good. I think I finally tipped the scales. I think I've been good enough. Can I ask you a question? How good is good enough? Because there's no grading scale, no line, no curve that you have to be above in the back of the Bible behind the maps. Be this good. List of good deeds. Check off these lists and then you get to go to heaven. No, the Bible tells us all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. That shows me you can't be good enough to earn your way into heaven. You're not going to make it just by being good. Okay, pastor, I see that, but I was raised in church. My parents told me we were Christians growing up. Maybe they hung a cross or a St. Christopher around your neck. Had you baptized or christened as a child? You went to religious classes like Sunday school, Sabbath school, maybe even catechism class. You've always considered yourself to be a Christian. Born in America. America is a Christian nation. Everybody born in America is going to heaven. We're not any other religions. We're not Buddhists. We're not Muslim. We're not Hindus. We're Christians, right? Wrong. Did you know that nowhere in the Bible does it say that because you were raised in church, your parents told you you were Christians growing up because you went to religious classes, wore religious jewelry, did religious things. Or that because you're not some other religion that by default you get lumped in the category of the Christian, you get to head for heaven and deny hell. It doesn't work like that. Come on, today, I'm loving you enough to tell you the truth. You won't make it to heaven that way. Ah, pastor, don't worry about me. My last church I got involved wasn't just a childish thing for me. I mean, my last church as an adult, I helped out, sang in the choir, carried the pastor's Bible, made decisions. People thought of me as a leader. Even got a membership card to that church and taught in the Bible classes. And while those are all great and wonderful things to do, none of them will get you into heaven. In fact, there are some church folk that were talking to Jesus, and Jesus tells a story about what's going to happen in the end. And these church people, they say, well, wait a second. Hold on, Jesus. Didn't we prophesy in your name? Didn't we do miracles in your name? I mean, come on. How many of us have that? And yet to that group of people, there was something wrong in their hearts because Jesus says, away from me, you workers of iniquity, I never knew you. Nothing wrong with prophecy, nothing wrong with working miracles. There are saints that do that that are going to heaven. But this group, even though they did those church things, they don't get to make it. It shows me you can't just hop out serving a church, have a membership card, and God's like some bank commercial saying, what's in your wallet before you get into the gates of heaven? It doesn't work. Some of you might be thinking, well, pastor, okay, I see what you're getting at. Don't worry about me. I know God. I know about Jesus. In fact, someone was witnessing one time. They asked me, do you know Jesus? I said, yeah. And they said, oh, then we don't need to talk to you. And they went and they found someone who needs Jesus. I sing the songs at Christmas every year of my life. Getting ready to celebrate Easter again as I do the resurrection every year of my life. I can quote scriptures, Pastor. Old and New Testament. Yes, and so can the devil. You know, you'll find the devil quoting scriptures in the Gospels. It's like the craziest thing you ever heard of in your life. The devil quotes scriptures? I would think his face would melt off if he quoted a scripture, you know? Like, I'm melting, I'm melting. You know, like, I, I just don't see that happening. And yet, in the scriptures, you see the devil quote scriptures to Jesus and nothing happens. In fact, the Bible says that he distorts the scriptures. That there are false teachers who will distort them to their own destruction. See, look at me, look at me. Everybody, look at me right now, even online. Look at your screen right now. This is not about what you have up here in your head. It's not about having mental assent towards God, knowing who Jesus is, or being able to quote a scripture or sing a song on a holiday. Rather, it's about your heart. John, the third chapter, Jesus is speaking, and he says this. If you want to enter the kingdom of heaven, you must be born again. Do you know who he said that to? He said that to a religious leader. He said that to somebody who was raised in church. He said that to somebody who we would have thought would know God, be able to quote the scripture, sing the scripture, debate the scripture. My goodness, how many of us could do that? And yet this great religious leader, he doesn't tell him you've done enough, you're smart enough, nice enough, pretty enough. He doesn't tell him any of those things. Religious enough, no. He says you must be born again. I know, I know, I know. Our society makes a mockery of that term. They've raked it to the coals. But let's not let society, Hollywood movies, television, books, and blogs on the internet define for us what being born again is. Let's let the Bible do that for us, shall we? What does being born again really mean? Well, from the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible, being born again has always meant the same thing. You ready for it? Here it comes. It means that you surrender to God all of your heart and that you've surrendered to God all of your life. It's just that simple. It's all or nothing with Jesus Christ. Let me prove it to you. Last book of the Bible, book of Revelation. Jesus is speaking to a church just like he's speaking to us here in this church and online today. 
And he says, when I come, I want to find you hot or I want to find you cold because if I find you lukewarm, he says, I'll vomit from my mouth. Well, that's pretty gross, wouldn't you say? I mean, vomit? Ugh, Jesus. And yet, what is he saying? He's saying half-hearted, lukewarm Christianity is not real Christianity at all because only people that are not real Christians will be ejected and rejected from the body of Christ. So you can't be a little in, little out, little up, little down, little token prayer every now and then, occasional church attendance. God is something in your life, but you're not wholehearted for God. You're not opposed to God, but he's not everything in your life. Listen, that's not going to make it. That's lukewarm Christianity. And Jesus said you won't make it. So today, I want to give you an opportunity. There are those of you in this place here live and online that you need to give all of your heart and you need to give God all of your life today. Today is your day of salvation. Here's the opportunity. Here's what it's going to look like. In a moment, I'm going to count to three. One, two, three. When I say three, I'm going to pop my hand on this microphone. Bang, just like that. When you're the sound of my hand popping that microphone, bang, that's your opportunity to simply raise your hand. So simple, so easy. What you're doing in the raising of your hand is you're saying something. You're making a statement. You're saying, I want to give God all my heart. I want to give God all my life. I want to be born again, headed for heaven, and deny my presence in hell. If you're here live, I'll see your hand go up. I'll count it. You can put it right back down online. Just put that hand up for a moment. God sees you. He's watching. And then you can put it right back down. You say, whoa, 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 wait a second. Time out. Pastor, if I raise my hand, I'll be embarrassed. Yeah, you might be embarrassed. That's okay. Think of the trade-off. Isn't it better to be embarrassed for a moment than it is to end up in hell forever and ever and ever and ever? No one make that trade. A moment of possible embarrassment for an eternity away from God? Come on. And yet the devil thinks you're a fool, so he's trying to talk you out of this right now. He's whispering in your ear, you're fine. Just sit there and do nothing. You don't need to do this. That pastor's a liar. No, the devil's a liar, the Bible says. Father of lies. He's a murderer from the beginning trying to kill you, trying to take you out of your destiny, trying to disconnect you from God. Today, tell that devil to go jump in a fiery lake. You're not going with him. You're going on with God today. Get ready to get your hand up. Listen, if you landed in hell, you'd raise both arms, both legs, your underwear on a flagpole if you could, but there are no exits in hell. The Bible says it's appointed for man once to die and then to the judgment. You're not coming back as a dog or a frog working your way up into a human. Get another shot at this. You've got one life to live this life. Say, Pastor, leave me alone. I got more time. I'll make a deathbed confession. Really? When is that? Next week? Next year? You got an appointment scheduled with God 20 years from now? Pencil me in on May 25th, 2035. Doesn't work like that. You don't know when you're going to die. No one knows. We're all one accident, one incident, one virus, one breath, one bomb away from eternity. Don't think it can't happen. It can happen at any moment. By the way, Jesus could come back at any moment. The Bible says he'll be like a thief in the night for those who are not prepared for his coming. You don't want to get caught unprepared. You need to be ready for his coming. Don't wait another moment. Count the cost. You cannot afford eternity in hell away from God. You need to give God all of your heart. You need to give God all of your life. Today is your day of salvation. Pastor, I prayed a prayer at one time. Isn't that enough? Well, no, because was it just a prayer and no heart and life behind it? Did you follow it up? By sticking with God, enduring to the end. Jesus said, he who endures to the end will be saved. It doesn't mean you pray a prayer one time, then you live like the devil and do whatever you want to do. God's no fool. Let's not treat him like one. You've got to give God all of your heart. You've got to give God all of your life. Not just a magical abracadabra prayer, and then God's so foolish. Oh, I guess they said the magic words. I guess they get to go to heaven now. No, you've got to live for Jesus. You've got to give him all of your heart. got to give him all of your life. Pastor, let me clean up my act first, and then I'll come to God. No, you come to God, and he'll clean you up from the inside out. Don't waste time trying to come to God. You can't perfect yourself. It's not going to make it. You can't be good enough to earn your way into heaven. No, you come to God, and he'll clean you up from the inside out. Today, who should raise their hand? If you've been running from God instead of to God, I'm speaking to you. Who should raise your hand if you're not sure about your salvation? Make sure today. Who should raise your hand if you've never done this before? Never giving God all of your heart, never giving God all of your life. I'm speaking to you. Or finally, who should raise your hand? Maybe you're lukewarm in this place, half-hearted. Maybe you backslid. At one time, you're on fire for God, but you backslid. You know what that means. You found yourself in places you never thought you'd be, doing things you never thought you'd do. And today, you need to come home. Today, you need to repent and turn to God, giving Him all of your heart and all of your life in a fresh rededication to the Lord. You can do that today in this safe and friendly place. Don't worry about your neighbor. Come on, this is between you and God right now. I'm going to count to three. Pop my hand on this microphone. This is your time. This is your moment. Get ready to get your hands up live and online. Here we go. One, two, three. Let me see your hands. Just raise them up high right now if that's you. Just get them up real high. You need to give God all of your heart, and you need to give God all of your life. Just raise them up real high. Is there anybody in this place here live? Even online, get that hand up real high. They're pointing this direction. Thank you. God bless you. There's one. Who else today? You need to give God all of your heart. You need to give God all of your life. Anybody else? Come on. Do you feel the Spirit of God just tugging at your heartstrings? You feel your heart beating out of your chest, you wish I'd shut up. That's an indicator that you need to give God all of your heart and you need to give God all of your life. 
Is there anybody else? I see that hand. Thank you. God bless you. Anybody else real quick? Come on, you need to surrender to God all of your heart. You need to surrender to God all of your life. Even online, come on, if you haven't already, get that hand up real high. Amen. Amen. It's wonderful. So, Pastor, can you see them? Do you have a video screen in their home? No. I just believe by the Spirit of God that people are responding. Today, you need to respond to God. Anybody else in this place? I'm going to give you one more opportunity. They're going to wrap this up. Don't miss this opportunity. Don't miss this moment. Is there anybody else you need to surrender to God all of your heart? You need to surrender to God all of your life. You won't be alone. I didn't embarrass them, and I won't embarrass you. Last call today. Last call. Then we're going to wrap it up. Anybody else? All right, let's give the Lord a hand. For those that already raised their hand, giving their hearts and lives to the Lord, let's all stand together as we conclude today. Those of you that raised your hand, or if you should raise your hand, but you didn't, it's not too late. I want you to get a hold of your coat, purse, sweater, Bible, a friend if you need a friend. Let's get in the aisle and meet me up front because we're going to change destinies together right here at the altar today. So let's welcome them. If you raise your hand or you should raise your hand, come on, get out of your seat. Get in the aisle and meet me up front right now. Come on. Parents, if your children raise their hand, bring them. Children, if your parents raise their hand, come with them right now. Come on down. Let's pray together. Come on down. Come on, they're coming. Let's give them a hand. You can come too. Come on, if you need to come, just come right now. Get out of your seat. Get in the aisle and meet us up front. They're coming. You can come too. They're still coming. Come on, let's keep it going from church. Let's encourage our new brothers and sisters. They're still coming. Anybody else, if you need to come, just come on right now. Come on, get out of your seat, get in the aisle, and meet us up front right now. Come on down. Well, hey, this is a great-looking family up here. Love you guys. So glad that you came. I'm going to lead you in a prayer to invite Jesus in your heart. You're going to be born again, brand new. Okay? God's going to do a work and a miracle inside of you where the old is gone and now new things have come. And there's no commitment worth anything without consistency. So I want to encourage you guys today. You're just starting a journey. Stay committed in that. Stay committed, all right? It's like going to the gym. If you go one time and never go back again, it doesn't do you any good. You got to keep coming, keep going to church, keep praying, keep connecting with God, right? Keep getting in the Bible, reading his word, learning and growing. Give us this next year. As you do over this next year, you'll look at your life and say, wow, look at what God has done in my life. Even online, if you're giving your heart to the Lord, I'm going to lead you in this prayer. We'll pray short, simple phrases. I want you to repeat them out loud. It's giving your heart to the Lord. You're not praying to me. You're praying to God, all right? And, and prayer is just simply talking with God. He hears your prayers. Okay? Everybody in the room is going to join in together with you just to encourage you. So you'll hear them all praying as well. So let's bow our heads and close our eyes. Everybody say these words out loud together in faith. Say, Father God, I come to you today in the name of Jesus. And I believe that Jesus Christ is your only begotten son. That he came and died for my sin and was raised again to life. Forgive me of my sin. Cleanse me of my past. And give me a future with you. Let it be known that from this day on, I'm following you. I'm a Christian. I'm born again, headed for heaven, denying hell. Thank you, Jesus. Fill me now with your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Hey, guys, welcome to the family. We're so excited for you guys. Now listen, I didn't grow in the things of God until I had a friend come and encourage me in the things of God, teach me some things out of the Bible, pray with me, that sort of a thing. And so we want to give you guys that same opportunity. So my friend over here, Antonio, this is Antonio Johnson. He is absolutely wonderful. He has the most wonderful Panamanian accent. He speaks Spanish, all right? It doesn't look like he speaks Spanish, but he does. He speaks it good, and he's a great man of God. He just wants to encourage you guys. Also, we have some, uh, a little uh, booklet for the kids as well, okay? Help her to know what happened and what is going on. Man, I love it. Jesus said, let the little children come to me. And so that's very precious, and so we're excited. So you guys make a left turn and follow Antonio right this way. Come on, let's give him a hand as they go. Hallelujah. Let's give the Lord a great big praise today. Come on, he's worthy. Hallelujah. 
And those of you that gave your heart and life to the Lord and prayed that prayer with us, just hang with us right after we dismiss, and there will be some instructions for you as well. Now, you heard in the announcements today that we do have prayer for the baptism of the Holy Spirit. My friend James over here, James Burks, this mighty man of God over here. You always hear James saying, good word. I love you, James, man. That encourages me. That's, it. That's his, his service, right? He's serving his pastor by saying that because it encourages me, and then I preach better afterwards. So praise the Lord. James wants to pray with you to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. The power of God will touch your life. You'll receive giftings in that moment. He'll describe how that works. He'll pray for you, and you're going to get baptized in the Holy Spirit and have the power of God on your behalf. So if you have not received that yet, you're welcome to be dismissed with James right here. Okay, he'll be up here by this pillar, and then you're just going to head up the stairs to the chapel area, and he will pray for you too. Right now, you're welcome to be dismissed, okay? You're welcome to head out right now, okay, if you need to. All right, parents, if your children in the children's ministry, they're going to wait for them as well, and they'll watch them until they're done with prayer for the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Can I bless you guys as we go? Would you lift your hands to the Lord? Let me bless you. Father, I bless your saints near and far from the top of their heads to the soles of their feet. They're blessed in the city, blessed in the field, blessed coming, blessed going. May everything they put their hands to, they shall prosper. Lord, with a great big shout of faith about our area, we declare that the Inman Empire shall be saved. Thank you, Papa. Hey, thank you so much for joining us online. If you just gave your heart to Jesus and prayed that salvation prayer with our pastor, congratulations and welcome to the family of God. Here at The Rock, we want to get you plugged in and set up for success as you start this new walk with God. In a moment, I'd like for you to head over to our Respond to God page by clicking the link provided in the comments where you can fill out your information so we can provide you with some free materials. We have a booklet called Welcome to Your Destiny, Easy Steps to a Successful Future with God. We'd love to mail you this paper copy if you are within the continental United States. If not, don't worry about it. We have an electronic copy in PDF format that we would be happy to email you. We also have a comic book we'd love to send out for any kids that have made a decision to follow Jesus. It helps explain their new walk with Jesus in a fun and age-friendly way. We not only want to provide you with these free materials, but if you live locally, we would also like to get you connected with a friend. A spiritual personal trainer, or as we like to call them, SPTs, who can help guide you through your new relationship with God. We encourage you to connect with the local church in your area. And if you are in the Inland Empire, remember you're always welcome here at The Rock Church. Well, it was great hearing the word of God with you guys today. We can't wait to see you at our next service. And remember, God loves you and so do we.